Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, here's looking at you. And we're talking about drones and their usefulness in tower inspections. Can they really save you money? I, I think they can. Sam Wallington of the Educational Media Foundation joins us to talk all about it and give you lots of practical advice. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by the Telos Alliance and the new Omnia Volt audio processor. More processing power in one RU than others give you in three. By BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide, where the remote sale is on. Save on headsets and remote packages at bswusa.com. And by Lavo, providing seamless integration of your work processes and the uncomplicated operation of complex technology. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerked. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. It's an extra, it's going to be an extra fun show today. So I'm glad you've tuned in. Tell your friends. We're going to be talking about uh, unmanned uh, aerial uh, systems or drones and using them, using them in effective and practical ways to do tower inspections and maybe some more applications. So that's that's what's coming up. I'm Chris. I said I'm Kirk Harnack. I, I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. They're my uh, full time employer. Well, I do this show on the side because I love it and I love uh, bringing interesting guests and information and technology to my fellow engineers in the broadcasting business. And we usually talk about radio. Occasionally, we talk about television as uh, more radio stations are incorporating TV technology and video into their operations. And, of course, we talk a lot about streaming and other digital delivery technology. So that's what the show's about. Everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and all that stuff in between. A lot of digital stuff, too. Uh, our show is brought to you by three terrific sponsors, the folks at Omnia and the new Omnia Volt. Also, bswusa.com, where they're having some sp uh, remote specials. And also by our friends at Lavo, L-A-W-O, Lavo.com. And if you go to their website, Lavo.com slash twerk. And that'll let them know that you heard about it right here. All right, Chris Tobin, uh, I heard, is trying to join us. Uh, he'll, he'll get here if, if he can. And if he can, that's great. If not, I've got a guest that's going to keep us happy for a whole hour. <laughs> and I just love what this guy's doing. Let's bring him in. It's Sam Wallington of the Educational Media Foundation, EMF. Sam, welcome in. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm doing well. Everything's good. Delighted to be here. So you, you, uh, you have a pretty important engineering position there at EMF. Tell us about that. So I'm VP of Engineering, so I head up a team of about 70 folks who uh, watch over a little over 900 signals nationwide. It keeps us busy. Wow, I didn't realize you had 900. That's uh, full power and translators combined? Yeah, about 50% uh, full power, 50% translator. Cool. cool. Well, we're going to get into this uh, talk about, about drones. Uh, you recently had an article in Radio World, which is how I found out about you and your, your interest in drones and using them for practical applications. And you know, as we were talking before today, I, I love big boy toys. I mean, that, that's just great. And if we can find ways to actually make our real jobs better, more practical, save money, be more prepared when we need to climb a tower or that a tower climb might be necessary um, before really bad things happen, well, that's a real benefit to our employers and to ourselves. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to be getting into. So um, uh, I'll, in the show notes, by the way, we'll have a link to the Radio World article. And Sam, if we come across some other things uh, during the show that we need to link to to give our engineer friends you know, more information, then we'll do that as well. And I'll make note of those as we, as we go along. Uh, before good. we get in, yeah. So before we, uh, we get into the meat and potatoes, uh, of course, the show isn't free. It's paid for by some terrific people, and the first one is the folks who, who I work for, the TELUS Alliance, uh, and that is Omnia. And I want you to watch this little quick piece about the new Omnia Volt. More top radio stations choose Omnia than all other competing processors combined. Now, meet the Omnia Volt, sharing lineage with Omnia processors like the Omnia 11, electrifying, competitive, market-leading audio in a compact one-rack unit package. With Omnia Heritage built in, the Omnia Volt includes Dynamics Magic from Omnia Chief Algorithm Designer Cornelius Gould, including six AGC sections from start to finish, deep bass, warmth, and stereo stereo enhancers, five-band time-align limiter, the world's best presets to get you started right, and spectrally pristine final processing designed by Frank Foti. Omnia Volt users love its quick tweak feature. Quick tweak distills years of processing knowledge and proven approaches into simple controls that turn you into a processing pro. Nail your signature sound in minutes using advanced presets or your own settings right from the Volt's front panel or a PC. 
Omnia Volt brings charisma to your station's audio. FM translators and low-power FM stand out among the crowd. AM stations maximize clarity and coverage. Digital broadcasts sound clear and musical without fatiguing artifacts. Smart design, clearly visible outside and inside. Input and output connections in analog, AES-3, live wire, and multiplex for FM. Automatic input selection handles redundant STLs. Remote control works with today's browsers, tablets, and smartphones. Idealized patch point for external watermarking. And hardened construction to withstand lightning strikes, surges, high RF fields, and harsh conditions. The new Omnia Volt is stunning. Everyone will know you've got an Omnia on your station. Omnia Volt is versatile too. DSP Core Firmware alters the personality of Volt to fit your changing needs. FM, AM, digital transmission, or studio processing. Volt can even be used as a standalone stereo generator. DSP Cores aren't extra cost add ons. Download the functionality you need for free. The Omnia Volt. Omnia Audio Processing for any station and a smart upgrade for aspiring broadcasters. Proven audio processing that'll leave your competitors in the dust. Thanks a lot to Telos Alliance and Omnia for sponsoring uh, this part of This Week in Radio Tech. And I can tell you the Omnia Volt's pretty cool. It's a great, great little processor for, as a backup or even as a main processor uh, in a lot of different market sizes. And it's very flexible, too. All right. Um, Sam Wallington is our guest. Sam, uh, so uh, we mentioned that we're going to talk about drones. I want to know, though, how did you... How did you get into radio engineering? What led you into this field? <laughs> well, that's been a long time. Uh, back in the ancient days, uh, I started running sound at church when I was 13 and uh, always attracted to sound, everything like that. So when I got to college, went into electronics, and uh, shortly as that was ending, uh, as I was about to graduate, um, there was a, a local radio station. The college station had gone kind of bankrupt and was being bought out, and I went and volunteered, and next thing I know, I'm uh, doing a regular shift and helping out here and there, and eventually they made me chief engineer, and it's all history from there. So, Oh, my goodness. That is not, not too different from, from mine. I think I skipped some of the college part, but uh, I, I, uh, I tell people I, I got shocked enough I learned where all the electrons hang out. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you need to, <laughs> need to know where they are so they won't bite you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, um, uh I, I guess we'll, we'll jump right into this drone thing. So uh, what, what prompted you to, to write an article in Radio World uh, describing your uh, efforts and findings and uh, you know, what you were doing with drones and towers and antennas? You know, the first time I saw drones uh, in use at a trade show, uh, I was just fascinated by it because immediately I'm starting to think, wait a minute, this gets me to places I can't go easily. And as we get more litigious and more complex in tower climbing, I started thinking about the possibility of using drones to take a look on the tower before I send out a crew or spend the money on a crew uh, just to find out they got up there and couldn't fix it because they didn't bring the right part. So having a drone allows me to take a quick look before they even get there. Well, in a little while, we're going to take a look at a short video that is uh, some editing that, that you've d done on some some drone inspection yourself. But let's, let's you know, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, I... I, I uh, uh, um, and sometimes I'm a little uncomfortable being in this position of trying to justify this thing I want to do. But luckily with drones, there are some specific tasks that we can easily justify uh, the relatively small expense of a drone. I mean, you send a tower climber up once or twice and you've paid for the drone, uh, especially if you go if the tower climber goes up there and doesn't have the right parts or discovers other things wrong while he's up there um, that he, he could have brought parts for. So I, you, you kind of alluded to that. Let's let's um, we're, we're, let's set pattern measurement off for a, a later subject because that is kind of a a, a real uh, piece de la resistance of, the, of drone flying <laughs> is, uh, is is that pattern measurement that is a big field complex uh, in and of itself. But let's talk about just just the visual stuff. Uh, when we were talking earlier, one of the first things you mentioned was rusty bolts. Tell me what but well, what can you really see from from your your drone shooting in 4K video um, as close as you want to get to the tower. Yeah, I think uh, Rusty Bolts was a DJ on a station I worked at once. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm but, not. <laughs> you know, it is uh, sometimes a challenge to get close. And in, in the video, when you show that clip a little later, um, you'll be able to see, uh, I'll come up close to behind a microwave dish and you can see the Rusty Bolts there. 
And uh, it definitely is a way to get in there. There can be some real challenges as far as uh, RF uh, perhaps overwhelming the front end of the radio on the uh, drone, losing mm-hmm. communication with it, those kinds of things. So we can talk about some of that too. But Yeah, yeah. We, before the show, we were talking about, about that very thing. And um, well, you, you didn't happen to bring a drone in your office there with you. Do you have one handy? I do. Uh, hang on one sec. Oh. I'll dip out a camera oh. for just a second. That's fine. I because I, I I have my Mavic, although it's it's behind me here. But we uh, we can in fact we can look at the differences. The two most popular drones, uh, f- you know, that are not super expensive. These are you know in the range of a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars or so. Uh, maybe your your uh, your Phantom Pro Four is a bit more than that. Uh, but so the, the these are a, a good price point that. People can afford and a, a tool that you can justify. But this thing about RF overload, um, you know, the drone is communicating with your controller on the ground. And on my Mavic, it's a, it's typically 5.8 gig, although I think the video gets returned perhaps in the ISM band, 900 megahertz or so, uh, is what I believe I've read. I know there's a 900 megahertz radio on, on board the drone. Um, maybe you can show us what, what you've got there. And, and if you know the frequencies involved with the, the Phantom, let us know about that. Yeah, this one's a uh, Phantom 3. I don't know what the frequencies are. I should play with that a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, let's see if I can get this on camera here. Okay for you. So you can get... Uh, uh, makes really nice uh, nice video, simple. Um, simple to operate. Uh, DJI has done a very good job of uh, writing code to make it easy to fly. Uh, yeah. Literally, literally, takeoff is uh, a swipe of the finger on your iPad or your phone, whatever you're using, and uh, it takes off and hovers a couple feet off the ground in front of you, and it's ready to go. So, makes it super easy. One thing that and we'll we'll take a, a some of the closer look at the construction of the drones in a minute. One thing I want to make really clear because I get this question all the time. I was just we were just talking about uh, drones and tower inspections at lunch today. Uh, actually, our Nashville SBE chapter just had a meeting at the uh, factory of Flash Technology. And they make strobe lights, and now 90% of their work is, is LED lights. Uh, and it seems in the next few months to a year, they're going to have a, uh, a high-intensity LED system available. Right now, medium intensity is the highest that they do. So anyway, we were um, <clears throat> talking about, about uh, drone and drone inspections there. Um, and and the the usefulness of that, so they could you know you might be able to you know get a clue as to what's wrong before you actually fly up. Uh, what I w- will end up many spending some time comparing. This one is the the Mavic Pro, and it's a completely different looking design than the Phantom. Both of these are really popular, but what I wanted to find uh, point out about the Mavic, and I've added extra tape to it. That's not stock. That's so I can find it at night if I lose it. <laughs> Shine a fl- <laughs> it's reflective tape. Uh, learned that one night after, uh, yeah, after after losing it, um, is that the the Mavic seems very compact, and any wires that are in it are really short. You know, the longest wires are the wires that go out to the motors, and everything else inside is is uh, is just really really compact. Now I don't know about the the um, construction or the design layout inside uh, the Phantom. And by the way, now I just remembered what I wanted to get to. I said that people bring this up all the time. Uh, a lot of folks believe that there is a hard legal limit of 400 feet of elevation off the ground that you can fly your drone. And for the most part, that's true. But there is an exception. Uh, and the exception and, and the exception stands for hobbyists or for commercial drone flyers. If you are next to a structure, if you're within 400 feet of a structure, whether it's a building, or a tower, uh, or a monument, um, as long as you can legally otherwise fly the monument, uh, you can fly higher than 400 feet. In fact, you can fly 400 feet above the structure that you're looking at. So if you have a 1,000-foot tower, uh, my understanding is, it, and it, others have told me the same too, it's perfectly legal to fly 400 feet above that tower. And so I've taken this drone several times to a height of anywhere from uh, 900 feet to 1,200 feet, but I'm always within 400 feet of the tower and never more than 400 feet above that tower. So, uh, Sam, is that your understanding as well, or do you have a, a different understanding? Yeah, absolutely. That is that is the way the rule is written, and uh, I love that they made that change when they implemented Part 107, so uh, it really does help in uh, being able to get there because that was a, a restriction. All uh, flights were limited to 400 feet. And now that's changed 
to allow for that, which is cool. The other interesting thing is that the, the that 400 foot limit, and that that does apply. You know, if you're not within 400 feet of a taller structure. Um, and by the way, I've heard some people say taller structures include trees. So you can fly 400 feet above trees. So you've got, you're on the ground, you got an 80 foot tree next to you, you can fly 480. That's what I've heard. That's, that's a pretty liberal interpretation of, of the rule. Um, uh, also, the, here's what I don't know for sure. And Sam, maybe you can fill me in. Is it 400 feet above the ground or 400 feet above your takeoff point? Uh, that's 400 feet above the ground, or whatever, or over the structure. Well, but but if you're, let's say I'm, fl- let's say I'm on the side of a of a hill, and mm-hmm. um, I could fly. Uh, maybe, maybe it's more than 400 feet to the top of the hill, and maybe it's more than 400 feet down to the valley. Can I fly 400 feet above my takeup point and then fly over the valley at maybe you know six seven hundred feet, or is it Might always understand. 400 feet above the ground? My understanding is 400 feet above ground or that building. So you would gotcha. have to descend yeah. to stay at 400 feet or below. Yeah. But the reason is that aircraft can fly down to 500 feet above ground, and you obviously you don't want to be uh, running into somebody else. So. Right, right. Well, there's a lot to be figured out. And, and you, you know, I'll, I'll say that my, my philosophy, Sam, is probably a lot like yours. I, I, I don't want to do anything stupid with this. Uh, first of all, I'm, this drone is commercially registered. Uh, registered for for commercial use, I am um, uh, commercially licensed myself as a Part 107 uh, licensee, and this has a an FAA registration number on it right here. Uh, it also has uh, well, there's a registration number there. I put my phone number on it. I put my email address, my website on it. If I lose this, I want somebody to find it. Uh, so <laughs> I really don't want to be flying where I shouldn't be <laughs> because then they know. Oh, look. Kirk Harnack flew this where he shouldn't be. <laughs> How, wh- what's your attitude about all that? Is it similar to mine, or you have a different uh, take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, if you look at mine, you can see the same registration numbers all over it. Um, I didn't put my phone number, but that's an idea. Uh, hopefully, I never lose it that badly. <laughs> we'll see. How'd, how'd but, you get uh, a tiny, short registration number? Mine looks like a, 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 a VIN number. <laughs> I found a guy, uh, yeah, well, this was uh, before they made it uh, a formal requirement. I was one of the wow. last ones on paper, so I actually have a November number on this one. Uh, oh, my all gosh. My other ones, wow. All my other ones have the VIN number. <laughs> that the, the long, long number. Long, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, so well, we've cleared up the 400 feet thing, so it's it's okay to fly next to a tower. Now, my, my DJI software won't let me fly above, I want to say it's 500 meters Period, because it doesn't know if I'm next to a tower or not. So 500 meters is what about 1600 feet, 1650 yeah. or so. Break so out the calculator here. Yeah. So yeah, if you calculate that, would be great. Uh, 1640 and, and uh, yeah, 1640 yeah. and change. So if I wanted to fly, I could legally fly up a 2,000 foot tower and above it, but the DJI software won't let me do that. I've heard of people have, have, hacking the software and uh, working their way around it or, or contacting DJI and getting custom software built uh, in their understanding of the rules. And yeah. uh, I understand that that's possible. Hmm. Okay. Well, so far, I don't have any 2,000-foot towers to inspect, but maybe some someday I, <laughs> I, I, I will. I, I have so, a 2,000-foot tower, but um, I can't see this thing above about 400 feet anyway, so uh, at some well, point, it gets tough to see. That's another legal – you legally have to be able to see it. Now, that's a little right. bit hard to square with the capability of the drone to fly, you know, a mile away from you easily. Uh, and you still have excellent yeah. radio contact with it a mile away, but you can't, you can't physically see it a mile away. Fortunately, you're allowed to use a, a visual observer, a second person mm-hmm. that can be in communication with you by radio or by, you know, I suppose semaphore, uh, some way to communicate with you to say <laughs> exactly what's going on. Yeah. That, that, so that can I can imagine, yeah, yeah, I can Go imagine ahead. someone. Uh, you know, you've got a tower climber at a thousand feet on a tower, and they could be your visual observer if they're in communication with you. So they could, they could, yeah, yeah. That um, I don't know. It's it's. it's I, I like to follow all the rules, but that's a rule that's kind of hard to square. I mean, frankly, if I get this thing, yeah, like you, more than four hundred feet away from me, it's it's a, it's a dot, and if you lose sight of it, it's hard to reacquire it. Yeah. In your, One of the things I've done is I've hung. Um, some brighter lights, like a bicycle tail light on the on the unit, makes it a little easier to spot. Yeah, tell me about that. What do you what do you put on it? 
Yeah, I have, uh, in fact, hang on one sec, let me grab it. One of these um, little hot shot uh, cyber lights from the back of a bicycle. I won't turn it on because it'll probably blind the camera. But, <laughs> uh, they're pretty bright and they last about 500 hours between charges. Hmm. And uh, I just kind of taped it on the side of one of the uh, rotor arms and it works really well. It doesn't unbalance the aircraft or anything. And it uh, gives me a little bit better visibility. The one challenge is they're a fairly narrow beam mm-hmm. width. So if you get more than about, I don't know, 5 or 10 degrees off uh, axis, you, it goes back to not being able to see it very well. So so do you point it down or back or how Correct, do you aim it yeah, for you? So let's see if I can show this on here. So I'll just hang it off uh, one arm like this so it's pointing straight down. Okay, down. All right. And then. Yeah, kind of taking the place of the lights that are built into the unit. They have the lights here on the, yeah. on the arm. So, so that works okay. Uh, but uh, it definitely having a second person on site, visual observer, helping, making sure things are uh, what you think they are is not a bad thing. Yeah, well, and legally you're supposed to keep it in view, but uh, that, like I said, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, so we, we were talking, I know we've been all over the place, we are talking about RF interference and... Uh, you said that you had experienced some RF interference, and I have not, at least not at broadcast tower sites. I have had an interference to the, this, this at least the spectrum analyzer feature on the software for this indicates that this is communicating in the 5.8 gig band. Uh, it, it may also be doing something at 2.4, I don't know, but the spectrum analysis it shows you is in the, 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 the 5.8 gig band. Uh, but I've never lost or felt like I've lost any control over this next to a broadcast tower. I have around my own house and doing other flying. I don't know what the interference was, but never near a broadcast tower. So that's that's why I'm wondering if, if the construction of the Mavic Pro is just a lot shorter wires, less less to pick up. Yeah, I've wondered that too. Um, this one, when, uh, when I brought it within uh, probably 25 or 30 feet of a two-bay circularly polarized FM antenna doing about six kilowatts, um, it activated the return to home circuit uh, mm-hmm. and just lost enough communication that it said, uh, I better better get out. So, Interesting. Interesting. It'd be interesting to have some kind of a shootout or, or um, well, in, um, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how you'd, how you'd test for that definitively. You'd, you'd probably have to put it into a, a chamber and a, a lab and the, and the, you know, well, and, and you're never sure what, what if you're disturbing the digital communications? At what point do you hit that digital cliff where it says, "Nope, I'm not talking. I'm coming home now." Yeah, I've assumed it uh, is overloading the front end of the uh, communications radio. Sure, um, just too much, too much signal there. It's obviously different frequencies. Well, obviously, DJI is making uh, progress as they come up with new drones. Uh, I it's about a year ago. I uh, a friend of mine loaned me his DJI Phantom Two, and um, it was pretty deaf <laughs> to, to radio waves. Uh, in, in fact, the Phantom 2, I think, came with a Wi-Fi booster that you had to separately mount and turn on. It was part of the the contraption that you held to control it. And it, it was pretty deaf to GPS a, as well. Uh, I took it to uh, to Cleveland, Ohio. I had a little bit of time um, uh, between meetings at, uh, at my employer, Telos. And uh, in an urban canyon environment, it just wouldn't pick up anything. It, it, I, I couldn't fly it. Not not under GPS control. This guy, I mean, it it typically it, it's reporting. It's looking anywhere from thirteen to eighteen satellites at once. Now a lot of those are Russian satellites because this one <laughs> operates, you know, both uh, U.S. GPS and Russian uh, GPS as well. Do, does yours give you a, a number of satellite readout that you're getting? It probably does. I haven't looked for that. Uh, I've been too busy having fun flying it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm, I'm told typically that I thought this one won't take off unless it has at least I think I think eight or nine satellites in view. Interesting. Uh, so, but luckily that yeah, doesn't seem of, to be a problem. One of the things uh, I have not done any RF testing on the uh, Phantom Pro Four, uh, which I want to do and see how that uh, reacts. One of the things about uh, flying the drones that folks might want to uh, know is to be sure to set your return to home location on the same side of the tower the drone's going to be because you certainly don't want to get uh, up to the antenna and discover that i don't know someone's antenna's on even if yours wasn't and mm-hmm. uh, 
cause an interference challenge and your your drone goes into return to home and tries to fly through the tower or through a guy wire or through someone else's antenna to get home, uh, it doesn't work so well. So it's definitely a thing to remember every single time is make sure you set that return to home. Well, this this is a, a bit challenging because um, you can set that return to home. Well, it, you, you recommend it being on the same side of the tower as you take off from so that if it does return to home, it's not, as you said, trying to fly through the tower through the guy wires. Um, I, I the the return to home altitude that you can set in the software, at least for the Mavic, um, is not nearly as high as the max altitude you can fly. Now, I think they do that because they don't want to chew up all your batteries just needlessly going up to some ridiculously high height. The assumption <laughs> is flying vertically up or vertically down it should be relatively clear of obstructions, right? Uh, so, so. Uh, uh, but but if you're flying, I think the maximum altitude for return to home on mine is about 500 feet. I could be wrong. Um, but if so, if I'm flying next to a 650 foot tower, there's no way that it's going to fly higher than the tower in order to return to home. So I would want to be, like you said, uh, uh, clear of obstructions between me and it. Should I lose control? Yeah, it's probably uh, as a belt uh, and suspenders kind of thing. You would want to set both when you can, uh, no. so that if I don't know, you forget or you happen to be wandering around the other side of the tower for, and for a moment and just forget that your uh, return to home is on the other side, it, it'll be a good backup for you. So back to some of the practical applications. Rusty Bolt's uh, beacon inspection. And, uh, of course, it, it, typical incandescent 2 to 620-watt bulb beacons. Um, hard to tell if the both are burning or just one is burning. So well, this can help you out, huh? Yeah, you'd be able to see, because you can look at it horizontally instead of at an angle, uh, like you would from the ground. And so it's a little easier to tell which ones uh, burn out. Or, worst case, someone's shot one out, and you can see the the broken glass or something and know to take up a, a, a new cover. That's a great, boy, that's a great idea. So, and that's, <laughs> that's that certainly happened because, you know, shooting out a beacon with a rifle, that is instant gratification for those who, who try <laughs> it, right? Hey, look at this. So... Uh, not not so much it, for the broadcaster, right? Right. So you you send a you send a uh, a tower guy up with a lamp, and he gets up there, and only to discover, oh, he can replace the bulb, but there's a huge hole, shattered hole in the side of the of the 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 the, the beacon, whether it's the the red beacon or a red filter with with clear, right. um, and he'd have to make a whole separate trip, wouldn't he, if he didn't know right. this? Exactly. Exactly. So might as well uh, find out in advance if you can, and. Have them uh, go up with the right stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the so the beacon out. Um, um, same thing for the obstruction lights too, though. Uh, yeah, you, absolutely. You, you may not know if if the if the glass needs to be replaced, or if it's just a bulb replacement. We've had a couple shot out over the years where they didn't actually shatter the entire thing. So from I don't know three quarters of the. Uh, circumference of the tower, it all looked red, but there was one quarter where it was a white light now. So, And of course, not only was the white light a problem, but the uh, we weather getting into the, the fixture. Uh, yeah, was eventually the that problem. becomes a bigger problem. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, radome damage. Talk to me about, about that. Yeah, so um, I don't, you may have had some cases where you've had ice fall on a radome and uh, shatter the top of the radome or cause a hole in it. And how, are you, how would you know uh, until you end up with a radome full of water and a whole lot of viswire and you're stuck. And a so tower nice. climb. And then you discover it once the tower climber is up there. Yeah, now I know what's wrong. Well, well, well now, now you've got to not only the tower climber has to make a second trip, he's got to make a second trip some other time because you've got to order the radome. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that... Right, that one situation can pay for the drone. Absolutely. Uh, plus, you can also uh, be able to see some of the damage. Perhaps somebody used the top bay of your antenna as a ladder. Uh, or, again, ice damage, something like that. You, you can inspect that, whereas uh, with the current, you know, without a drone and having to climb is the only way to take a look at the top of an antenna. Hmm. I like that idea for radome damage. My own radio stations don't. We don't have any radio. We're in, mostly in Mississippi, and and we have two stations in American Samoa where there just is no ice. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, in a lot of a lot of the U.S., we we do deal with that. Um, I wonder if 
if uh, if, if you looked into uh, infrared cameras being fitted to a drone? Yes, um, FLIR does make a, a camera uh, that will do that. So I'm not sure. It's pretty pricey still. I'm a little mm-hmm. uh, concerned about that. And uh, obviously, it won't fit something more like this uh, off-the-shelf drone. You'd need to build one up from a, a kit, build a frame and motors and all that and do it yourself. Uh, but yeah, there are, they are available, and it could be very handy. Uh, I was looking on the FLIR website, and they were talking about using it for roof inspections, air conditioner inspections, those kinds of things. Uh, but certainly, I've wanted to play with it for determining if there's a hot spot in my coax or the antenna, there's a tuning issue or something like that. Maybe my uh, de-icer heaters aren't working. Maybe I can tell uh, where. Yeah, because on, on the ground, all you know is that the current is not as much as it should be on the de-icers, right? Right. Yeah, or a whole lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, or they're shorted. <laughs> so, uh, uh, now, think about this. If, if you wanted, I hear people say, oh, I want to look for hot spots. I want to look for hot spots. Um, if it's a hot summer day, then the the temperature difference between the hot spot and the and the warm coax in the sun may not be very much but you might yeah, I, w- I wouldn't imagine that would work too well in the sun yeah absolutely if you, if you fly it first thing in, in the morning when it, technically it's not legal to fly a drone at night um, but you could fly it first thing in the morning at, at daybreak uh, have proper light and the coax would still be cool yeah exactly yeah. Uh, unless you're in Phoenix and then it probably isn't cool at all for a few months <laughs> until the winter right <laughs> well, at, at least you'd have that temperature contrast. I, I, would, <laughs> right. I would hope. Yeah, that, it's the contrast you're, look, you're, you're looking for. Um, it does raise the possibility of using the drone for things other than tower inspections. Uh, you know, a, a transmitter building, uh, taking a look at the roof, those kinds of things, looking at a studio building roof, air conditioners, all that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. That you may not want to necessarily climb up, especially if you're strict on OSHA with nothing more than six feet without uh, being tied off. So. Mm, yeah, yeah. We've got uh, some more ideas to talk about, including uh, feed horns and and paint, and we'll have a video to look at. Uh, Hey, if you've just joined us, uh, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. It's our 356th episode. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack, and just delighted that Sam Wallington, uh, the VP of Engineering for Educational Media Foundation, has joined us. Uh, They're the company that operates uh, K-Love and Air One uh, across the the U.S., and... um, uh, we're talking about drones and using them in practical ways to look at uh, at towers. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by my friends at BSW, Broadcast Supply Worldwide, and the website bswusa.com, where our remote sale is on. You can save up to 43% on a wide variety of remote broadcast gear from top manufacturers, and this is going on in July and August. Now, every you know, at, at, at Telos, uh, we always thought, well, when should we really promote our own remote gear? And the answer is well, right before all the high school sports and the college sports seasons uh, start up. So um, uh, that that's why BSWUSA.com is having the sale right now. They had, do have um, some packages going on here to get you ready for high school or college sports. Uh, or, you know, a lot of stores, start, you start having more remotes in the fall, back to school. Uh, uh, car dealers start having more sales. There's just more activity going on in terms of uh, on-air remotes, live remotes from from sponsors and uh, and sporting events. Well, one thing that you can do right now during this special from BSW USA is pre-order the new Comrex Access NX. Wow, this thing is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you can uh, order pre-order in right now. You get um, the Audio Technica BPHS One headset. Uh, for an extra low price, the portable codec offers faster processors, powerful error correction, and a handy touchscreen. No more using the little pen to pick things out. Just touch it with the touchscreen. And that's the new Comrex Access NX. Uh, it's the uh, successor to the Comrex Access, which has been very popular. Also, uh, hey, when you're out on remote and you need to talk to a crowd, they have portable PA packages. Uh, those are on sale. You can get the... Uh, um, 175-watt Passport Conference, the 375-watt Passport Event, or the big honking 600-watt Passport Venue bundled with two free jam stands, speaker stands, and carrying bag. Those packages start at $400, and that way you can address your audience there. Plus, lots of other remote packages as well from Comrex, Tyline, 
JK Audio. Uh, you can get these bundled with field mixers uh, and headsets, um, even a waterproof case in, in some of their packages. You save up to 38% on those. And here's something cool. You know, JK Audio makes this Remote Mix 4. It's a four-channel field mixer and headphone amp uh, that pulls triple duty as an advanced communication interface. It's factory sealed, comes with a full manufacturer warranty. You save money because it is B-stock. That means somebody else touched it before you did. Uh, and it's only $1,099 for the sophisticated uh, JK Audio Remote Mix 4. Lots more specials, including uh, pro headsets from uh, Sennheiser, uh, from Audio-Technica, and also this uh, the sports video package from HDV Mixer. So you're doing high school sports on the radio. You want to stream the video, provide extra um, you know coverage, uh, extra sales opportunities for your, your radio station. Check out the HDV Mixer sports video production package. It seamlessly integrates video from two cameras, lower thirds, graphics, social media, and more. And it, uh, it runs on the included laptop computer. Check that out. Um, it's just, just amazing. Check it out. BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide. And the website, of course, is bswusa.com. You can uh, buy these packages right there. Or you can give them a call at 800-426-8434. And remember, at BSW USA, you can order as late as 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, if it's in stock in their warehouse, they'll get it out the door and onto a plane on its way to you from their big uh, warehouse in Columbus, Ohio, right next to the UPS facility. So how convenient is that? Thanks a lot, BSW, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, it's episode 356. We're talking with Sam Wallington of uh, Educational Media Foundation about one of my favorite subjects, and that's drones. I've had just a blast flying mine and um, Sam, uh, what was the first drone that, that you got and started playing with? That would actually be this one that I have here, the uh, Pro 3. So it's pretty good. Oh. Good little drone. Yeah. So, so you never wasted your time on the $69 drones from the Chinese <laughs> uh, website aggregators, huh? Well, okay, you can uh, <laughs> count the $12 one I bought for my kids that uh, you, know, you charge, <laughs> charge USB for about eight minutes and fly for about yeah. two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually after bought one you, of those. After uh, you uh, kill the siblings, you know. Yeah, yes, I run into them. I, I a few years ago, I bought one of those AR Parrot drones. Okay, uh, is a fr French manufacturer, and it was okay, but it had absolutely no stabilization, um, so it was hard to fly, and you kept running into things. Uh, it, it did have a forward camera and a downward camera, so that was kind of cool, uh, and you just used your cell phone to to control it. Uh, I guess my point in in saying that. Uh, your first experience, you know, with a, a, a good drone, uh, my uh, second or third or fourth experience with a, with a good drone, these are much easier to fly than the $69 drones, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. The uh, There's a kid that's in my neighborhood. I hear him in the park every so often, and he has one of the less expensive drones. And mm -hmm. he flies the, the wheels or wings or whatever you want to call them off of that thing. Um, and, uh, but it's definitely in his control and he's done a good job of learning it, but, uh, I think I'd probably run into everything. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not all that coordinated and it's, uh, it's really nice, uh, with this to not have to focus a hundred percent on flying, um, you know, I'm moving my hand just perfectly. Instead, I can be thinking about, all right, I, I want to get this angle shot or this picture. Um, and I, I know that the aircraft will stay where it uh, belongs <laughs> while I'm mm -hmm. while I'm working. The GPS well, and stuff helps keep that, it when, even when it's a little breezy. See, that's a key point because we we, we humans uh, sure we feel the wind, but we're not so affected by the wind. But an aircraft is living in the wind, and if you know, I I flew little planes for a while, and you know, I know all about that. You're always crabbing left or right. As you're flying, you're almost never flying straight to get somewhere. When you're landing on a runway, you're almost always, you know, crabbing a little bit one way or the other to fly straight for the runway and then straightening out just before you're going to land. Uh, point there is that if, you're, if your experience, fellow engineers, is with a, an unstabilized drone, then um, you've really had it tough. These are much easier. Generally speaking, you, you fly this to a point and you just let it hover and it will stay there Typically within a foot or two of the same place, it just it just won't go drift off somewhere. If the wind blows, this thing will tilt into the wind, no matter which way it's coming from. And then the gimbal on the camera keeps your video beautifully still. So this thing can just be all over the place correcting, I mean, literally like this, and you have beautiful still video. You have the same results with your Phantom, don't you, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. It works uh, very well for that. 
And in fact, um, uh, it's kind of fun to watch it try to compensate uh, for wind. So I'll take it out in 10 or 15 mile an hour wind and uh, it's really stable. It's surprisingly so, which is very handy because sometimes the uh, weather is very calm on the ground, but you've got a decent wind up at the middle or top of a tower. It's nice to be able to know that it will stay in the right place. If you've climbed towers, you know that's the case. You can think, well, it's just a calm day down here, and you get 300 feet up, and your your face is getting wind burned. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's right. So, and you don't want you, your drone wind burned. <laughs> and now, sometimes I will get the uh, the display message on the app that says, "Hey, you're you're in high winds. You want to consider coming home." But to me, I, I've just found that that the that warning is really conservative. Uh, it, it 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 warns you well before you're at the limitation of the capability of the drone to 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 hang still. Yeah, uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, to me earlier, Kirk, was that you've done that uh, point of interest feature, where yeah. you'll uh, set that at the center of the tower and then uh, let the drone circle around the tower for mm -hmm. you, and uh, you're just kind of supervising its its path. Uh, that can work really nicely for getting some great shots of a tower. It it can and uh, um, to me it's it's uh, now I'd be afraid to do that really close in. Uh, yeah, I don't know too. why I should be afraid, but but and and just to let our friends know the, the way that works is is really pretty simple. It's, it's uh, probably similar on, on your app. The way I do it is I I make the camera point straight down, and on the DJI controller you push one button and it just flip, it flips straight down, and you fly over the top of the tower and just get right over it. So you're looking straight down at the beacon. And the tower straight down, and it's pretty stable. You might drift a little bit, but it's pretty stable. Well, you you open the flight mode and uh, tell it I want to do a point of interest shot. I, I call it an orbit shot, but whatever. Um, and you tell it, this is the point that I want to circle, and you set that point. And then, what I do is I back the drone off and I bring the camera back up, and typically I will then lower the drone's altitude to something lower that for the the pretty shot that I want with the, the tower in front of it. Now, I don't get so low that I'm in any danger of hitting the top guy wires. Um, if I am going to, if I want to get lower and circle it, then I've got to get farther back from the tower. And that's, now I am looking visually at it. And then, at least on the Maverick and probably on yours too, you tell it, okay, start circling. Now, you got to remember to hit the video record button, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Otherwise, you just do it again. And then you can tell the app how many miles an hour you want to go at around this point of interest. Um, and it's a slider. And which direction? Do you want to go clockwise or counterclockwise? And, it, and of course, the, the calculus is known as to how big this circle is based on how far you've backed away from the object. So it will tell you how long it'll take to make a circuit. You want to go two miles an hour, it'll take you four minutes. You want to go eight miles an hour, it'll take you 38 seconds or whatever it is to, you know, to go around. And uh, uh, so that's a really handy feature, and it makes it look like it makes it look like you know what you're doing <laughs> when you're circling <laughs> the tower. Uh, and it's, it, it, is a, it does make some beautiful shots. Um, but tower inspections typically don't do well from 20, 30, 40, 50, 200 feet away. You've got to be a lot closer. And so let's spend some time talking about being a little nervously close to the tower so you can <laughs> see these bolts. And I, I, we should point out, you know, there, there are people who are afraid of, hey, that drone was flying over my house and, and, and spying on me. These cameras are not telephoto cameras. These are pretty wide-angle cameras. They're intended for a beautiful view, not to spy. And, you know, look how long the lens is on this thing. It, sorry, that's just not going to, you know, zoom in on your pool party um, unless you're, you know, 20 feet overhead. So point is, if you want to look at bolts and feed, feed lines and uh, beacons, you're going to have to get this thing close to the tower. So, Sam, talk to us about the technique of flying close. Now, the best way I've found to do it is to actually do the vertical movement away from the tower. So I do all my up and down work um, 20, 30 yards away from the tower, uh, typically centered between a pair of guy wires. So I'm not running the risk of running into a guy wire. And then once I get to the right elevation, which I can see from the camera as well as from the uh, visual uh, viewing of the drone, uh, then I'll slide horizontally in toward the antenna or whatever it is I want to look at. Now, if I'm doing, um, if I've got a fairly empty tower, 
sliding up and down is not that big a deal. Uh, but if I'm worried at all about running into another antenna or going into someone's aperture and uh, overwhelming the drone radio with too much RF, uh, things like that, I want to be farther away. So both of those will work, but the easiest or safest, I should say, is to go up and then zo- move yourself in, uh, or move the drone in to make sure that you get the shot you want. Um, if your drone is handy, can you show me what collision avoidance that your your Phantom has, if, if any? Uh, the 3 has, uh, I understand it has some, but it's not visual. Uh, ah. It's not visible on here. On the 4, you can actually see what looks like a couple of little eyeballs on the front side of it. And uh, it works really well. We actually uh, work gently and then more aggressively experimenting uh, just here outside the studio. Um, there's a concrete block wall right behind the studio. So we would move closer and closer, and it would, sure enough, send the alert, you know, you're okay. So we tried that at a faster rate, and we finally, uh, at the end of our experiment, we just full throttle straight for the wall, which was really hard to do, honestly. <laughs> oh, that's hard to do. <laughs> I was like, oh, this, this isn't right. But sure enough, it caught it. Wow. One, uh, one caution mm-hmm. about that, though, we did learn that you can back in to the wall or whatever it is fast uh, beyond that because there's no sensor on the backside. So you can back in and then turn around and get that close-up shot if you need it, and it won't back away. So you've crossed that threshold, okay. and no longer uh, is it relying on that radar. So it's you, you will run into the wall if you try it from there. Now, that behavior no, sounds... No, we didn't. <laughs> the the behavior that you're describing sounds different, but... Most of the same, but a little bit different than the behavior that, that, that the Mavic has. I really like the way that – now, this one has the two little eyes on the side here, and mm-hmm. that helps determine the the range uh, toward toward the object. This one, like yours, starts warning you about 20, 24 feet away. And, but this one lets you just keep flying right up, right up into it, uh, I think – I'm not sure as close as you want. I've been, with, I've been to where the radar gets me down to like two feet away. I'm not sure I've gone any closer than that. Now, if you're flying and an object is in the way, yes, indeed, this thing will stop on the best dime that it possibly has. I mean, it'll it'll throw itself up like this and throw all the thrust forward to stop in time, uh, especially if you're headed toward a kid or a car or, or your house or a wall, as you say. Um, I'm, I don't think I've ever recalled, uh, you know, you can turn this off. I'm sure you can on yours, too, and fly as close as you want, including, you know, hitting right. the hitting the blades. Um but I've been able to fly right up to a couple, literally two feet away from a tower, and and hover there, and, uh, with with the radar on. Maybe it has to do with the function of how fast you're approaching it. Yeah, I think there is a relationship there. It definitely alarms uh, and reacts more strongly when you're moving quickly, um, and it's a little more gentle when you're sl- uh, slowly approaching. <laughs> but the uh, uh, the other thing I was going to mention is that uh, yes, you can turn that feature off and. Uh, get in as close as you choose to, uh, which hopefully isn't too close. So we were talked earlier about the, uh, the propeller guards and, uh, I had, I had tried one pair, one, uh, uh, third party pair for, for this Mavic. And I wasn't happy with it at all. It just, it, they were very flimsy. Um, the DJI ones for this hold together a lot better, but they still leave the whole front exposed there. You, if you could fly this into a flagpole or a tower leg, uh, mm-hmm. Even with the prop guard in place, and it would not help you. But I, w- I want to point out that, uh, that just like yours, there's no rear collision avoidance. There's no side collision avoidance on this one. I've heard that maybe I heard that the the, the uh, Phantom Pro Four did have collision avoidance in all directions. Uh, it's definitely not all, but it may have it on okay. the sides. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, and so yeah, that you, you mentioned when you're going up and down the tower, you do it right between the guy wires. Because you don't want to, uh, you know, look like you're okay, but a, but a prop is sticking out there, and you end up catching a guy wire. That's going to be the end of of your drone flight that day. Well, and you've got a lot of parallax too. When you're on the ground looking straight up or slightly angled, it's very mm-hmm. difficult to see exactly where the guy wire is relative to you. And uh, oh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's such a small area. It's hard to catch even in a camera camera view. So staying as far away from guy wires as possible is. Uh, Makes your life a little more peaceful. Tell you what, now might be a good time. I've, I've been putting this off. <laughs> to hold the audience through. We're going to show this video. Uh, <laughs> let's let's see if we get Suncast to show us this video. There's no audio along with it, so we can talk over and you can tell us tell us what we're looking at as we see this. Go ahead, Suncast, and, and roll it. Yeah, sounds good. 
So uh, this would be just an example of uh, flying up, straight up the side. As you can see, I'm, I don't know, 20, 30 feet away. Uh, just get an overview of what's on the tower, how things fit together, that kind of thing. Um, there's a, I think this is a five bay antenna, if I remember right. Uh, that one happens to be an auxiliary, so it's off. And uh, you'll get a nice close up of it here in a minute. And uh, Man, this tower has a lot on it, doesn't it? Yeah, t typical overloaded tower. Wow. But as you can see, we can get pretty close. Um, I think I get How even close. How close are you there? Maybe, maybe three, four that's feet? That's probably three, three, three or four feet, yeah. Okay. Uh, this was a little bit breezy that day. It was about uh, probably an eight to ten mile an hour wind, so I was being uh, a little more conservative than I might otherwise. Um, nice little two bay ERI there. And then uh, coming back down, you can see some of those uh, different cellular and uh, broadcast antennas on the way down. There's a uh, microwave dish coming up here. Uh, oh, forgot about that. Uh, this is another, this is looking at a building just to get a feel for how it might look to work, look on a uh, rooftop or a satellite. Oh, here's another oh, use we yeah. haven't talked about. Take a look at the power pole. Uh, did yeah. the power company or the telephone company seal that up when they were done? Those kinds of questions. So that's another possible use that you can, you can try. Yeah. And uh, again, zooming in on uh, one of the things that uh, you and I talked about earlier is the uh, looking at aftermarket cameras and stuff and aftermarket platforms to uh, yeah. try to get some that you can remotely zoom rather than flying closer, just zoom in with the lens. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is the uh, rusty bolt. I don't know if you'll be able to see it unless you're full screen. Uh, this was shot in uh, 4K video. And I downscaled it, uh, I think, to 1080p, and then uploading it to YouTube took it down even further. But um, just to give you a feel for, you get some pretty decent resolution out of them. Yeah, I, I tend to shoot either in 2.7K or, or 4K. Uh, I think the camera on the Phantom is reportedly a little bit better, and the images that I see from your video, to me, just look a little bit more vibrant and uh, spectacular than uh, what comes off mine. But there's, I think there's debate there as to which one's better yeah in this shot you can see uh some paint possibility needs needs of paint uh guy anchor uh points things like that mm -hmm. get a good feel for what's going on uh the tuning section of the antennas they're off to the left mm -hmm. see if the uh, tower crew actually assembled it correctly so it's always uh, not a bad idea to send up a drone before and after a tower crew uh, is on site if the uh tower crew is about to start it's uh, not a bad thing for them to be able to take a quick look uh, at whatever they're going to be working on before they climb and then when they're done you can go up and inspect to make sure they did it the way you explained Works you know well. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a time years ago when I had a tower crew uh, assigned to um, uh, redo some coax for an STL antenna and we had two STL antennas and I was very clear with them about which one to disconnect and of course, they disconnected the one that was on the air. And right. by the time we could get word to them and 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 get the meaning of the of our word to them, we'd been off the air for forty minutes. And <laughs> had I been able to take a picture and say, "Okay, you see these two antennas? Don't disconnect the bigger one at the top. Disconnect the littler one down below. That's the antenna you want to deal with. You know, would have <laughs> saved the day. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And, uh, yeah, one of the things that one note about uh, flying with a crew, um, flying with the crew on the tower may be fine. Uh, just remembering the rules that don't allow you to fly over per people. Uh, you're not allowed to fly the drone over a person that is not actively involved in the uh, in the flight. So a visual observer, it is legal to fly over them because they're involved, mm -hmm. but uh, not legal to fly over, say, a crowd or um, oh, sure. A tower sure. crew guy or whatever. And if, if you are going to send a drone up while the crew's up there, you definitely want to coordinate with them before they climb so you know, they know exactly what you're going to do and uh, they won't feel unsafe. Uh, you want no surprises. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, don't want them, I don't want them, you know, swinging a lanyard at it to <laughs> yeah, get it out of the way. <laughs> get away from me, Trump. Yeah, you definitely want to have that conversation uh, b before, yeah, beforehand. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Um, Sam, we're going to be running out of time here shortly. Uh, 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 we're going to talk about our, our, our uh, third sponsor, Lavo. But when we come back, uh, Sam, I wonder if you might uh, pass along uh, you know, a, a key tip. If you were 
if you were giving some final instructions to, to one of your guys before they uh, fly the drone up the tower and have a close look, uh, I'd like to leave our, our viewers and listeners with a, a tip of the week having to do with drones from your, uh, your experience in flying them. Can you do that when we Absolutely. come back? Absolutely. All right. You are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 356. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Sam Wallington. He's the VP of Engineering for um, uh, Educational Media Foundation. K Love and, and Air One. Our show is brought to you in part by my friends at Lavo, L A W O. Go to their website, but please let them know that you came from here. Lavo.com slash twirt, L A W O dot com slash T W I R T. Well, the benefit of using the slash twirt is you don't have to go look at the great big consoles. Of course, if you want to drool over those, you can. <laughs> but uh, this will take you right to the radio on air consoles. The radio on air consoles and uh, virtual radio systems, radio uh, audio routing systems. Uh, and the, even the, you know the new Ruby console that they introduced recently is uh, listed there. But I want to talk to you about something pretty interesting that's built into some of the uh, Lavo consoles. Yeah, maybe in all of them. But um, and that is this this auto mix. We've talked about that before on the show. And uh, recently, um, Bill Bennett, who has been a guest on the show from Lavo, uh, he was invited to Pittsburgh's uh, NPR member station WESA FM to demonstrate the capabilities of auto mix. Now that's the hands free automatic mixing system that's engineered into many Lavo radio mixing surfaces. It's an intelligent algorithm. It allows mics, phone callers, remote guests, and even music playout to be mixed automatically by the console. Now, it's especially effective, catch this now, in multi-mic situations where auto mix rides gain on mic channels for the perfect blend of host and guest presence. Now, this is especially important when you have a situation where... Um, you have a bunch of bikes in a room. If they're all open together, you get a lot of phasing. You get additional echo from the room. You get artifacts that you really don't want when you have so many mics open in a large studio. And it's nearly impossible to eliminate that with conventional manual mixing. The board ops simply can't respond to, to, uh, to when people talk and when they shut up uh, quickly enough on multiple faders with that kind of split-second accuracy. But according to Bill Bennett, the Automix audio was markedly better. It was like we moved from an echo chamber into an acoustically perfect studio. No phasing, no echo, no room noise. And all mic levels were perfect without upcutting or artifacts. You know, upcutting, boy, that occurs a lot when you've got a multi-mic situation. You're trying to ride gain. So the difference with auto mix was dramatic. There's even uh, audio clips that you can hear on the uh, Lavo website, and I will give you a link to that uh, in, uh, in the show notes uh, where we uh, give you a link to, to Lavo so you can see about all about auto mix and how that works and what the results of the audio are. That's a, a, just another feature that you'll find in Lavo radio consoles. I want to make sure you knew about that and its importance. Thanks to Lavo.com slash twerk for sponsoring this week in radio tech. And I hope you'll visit the website and check out their whole line of radio products. Thanks again, Lavo. All right, we're about to wrap up the show. Kirk Harnack here along with uh, Sam uh, Wallington. And if, if I could make uh, one tip before Sam makes his tip, I recently lost control of this drone. And luckily, it was right here in my neighborhood, which there are a lot of trees in my neighborhood. Luckily, it didn't land in a tree, uh, but it did come down. And it came down in a neighbor's yard. Um, glad it didn't hit the neighbor's roof or land in the swimming pool uh, or, again, land in a tree. Funny thing was, it came down just out of sight. I couldn't see it, but it was a quiet evening and I could hear, I could hear the thud of this landing upside down. And then I heard a really funny noise. I heard, I'll try to do the noise. <laughs> there were turkeys in his yard. <laughs> and the, the drone, the drone disturbed the peaceful turkeys, and they started gobbling. And I, literally, I'm I'm a couple houses away from where it landed, and I I heard that I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is crazy. So I uh, actually, it, it was quicker to get in the car and run over there because it's kind of around the block. So I ran over there with the car, and I could still see on uh, the drone was still transmitting video, and I could see the, the video upside down. And I, what went wrong? What went wrong? Um, and th it didn't hit the turkeys. They were fine. No turkeys were injured in, in the failing of this drone. Um, but uh, it did it did scare them, I think. Um, and what I found was that uh, one of the propellers had departed. And I'm pretty sure it was just completely my own fault. Uh, on the Mavic Pro, it's a little three-point uh, catch system. And it, it I really can't show you here on the on the 
video, but it, it they they twist lock into the top of the motors, and the prop departed cleanly. I mean, there wasn't any part of it left over. So I think I just didn't have it locked in. And uh, I, I leave the props on. I don't take them off. So I assumed they were okay, but you know what happens when you assume. So pre-flight, uh, that was covered on the Part 107 test, and it's important. You really should pre-flight. Make sure the battery is clicked in and won't depart, because if that departs, then you have a rock in the air. And uh, check your props. Make sure that they actually are properly attached. That's my tip. Sam, how about you? You got a tip for us? Yeah, thank you. I was a little worried you were going to say that we had to have turkeys on site to find the drone in the crash or something. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, so uh, I actually have two tips. Uh, one is that it's really tempting to go buy the drone and go fly for work, and you just can't. Uh, go get licensed. It's not that difficult. Spend some time online, study, get the license. Um, it's not terrible. Uh, it's worth the effort. And then you can fly in peace and not worry about it. And the other thing is, don't just go out and uh, say, here I am at the tower site. I just bought my new drone. Let's go. Um, take it out and practice in an oh open gosh. field or a yes. parking lot or something. Learn how this thing works. Let the controls become automatic so you're not accidentally going backwards when you want to go forward. And uh, your brain knows how to compensate for when it's facing the other direction and all that kind of stuff. So practice, practice, practice. And um, that, that, that's super advice. And, and if, if you're an enthusiast, like I am, like you are, you probably just like to, hey, you know, when the, when the show's over here, actually the uh, the family's going out to get some dinner, and when I come back, I'm going to fly the drone for 15 minutes. I'm, I'm going to use up one battery, well, maybe 23 minutes, and use up one battery <laughs> and just get some practice, just because I, I can and I like to, and I find it relaxing just to, just to look around the neighborhood and fly up, fly down, fly around, and, and get, the, get that muscle memory in there to make sure, just like you said, you if, if it's coming towards you, remember, left and right is backwards, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want that surprise the other at the wrong moment. You can definitely crash the drone by doing the wrong thing, which uh, <laughs> yeah, I have. I'm like, several times I've meant to go up and backwards when and instead I went forwards faster. <laughs> that doesn't end well. <laughs> Another thing that's uh, fun to do is just some practice of uh, setting some challenges for yourself. Uh, can I land on top of this smaller object, for example? Mm. Uh, put a box out in the backyard. Can I hit it? Can I land on it? So, yeah. Yeah. It's good practice. Very cool. Very cool. Sam, this has been so enjoyable. Thank you very much for taking an hour to uh, to spend with us and, and talk to our engineering community about uh, about drones and their usefulness. Thanks so much for having me. It was an honor. And I hope to, uh, maybe we can get together sometime and fly drones together. That would be, just be awesome. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, there's a station that you guys are, are looking at, and I have some beautiful video of it. So I'll pass that along to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Sam Wallington has been our guest on This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, coming up, let's see, in the coming weeks, we've got, oh, we're going to do a show on IT security for radio stations. And uh, let me find that real quick here. Um our, one of our guests coming up for that is going to be uh, Matt Aaron. Uh, he's with the Dave Ramsey Show. Uh, so that's going to be pretty cool. Also, uh, coming up next week, um, ah, we're going to have a show about when to call a consultant in. You know, when, can you, when, when should you save the money and not call a consultant? And when should you really get a dispassionate second set of eyes to, to look at, at your problem? Uh, so those things are coming up. Also, uh, in the coming weeks, Dave Anderson had been scheduled on our show. Uh, we weren't able to get him on. Dave had some other things pop up. So we're going to get Dave back on talking about rehabilitating uh, tower anchor points. I didn't know that was a thing, and it certainly is. And so Dave's going to talk to us about that uh, coming up in the, in the coming few weeks. Uh, so there you go. Uh, well, always got a good show. Tell your friends about This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks a lot to Suncast for being our producer uh, every week. We really appreciate his efforts. And to Andrew Zarian, founder of the GFQ Network, home of other fine podcasts, including What the Tech with Paul Ferrat. I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.